It's time for the double stop with Brian Sword. Welcome to the double stop. I'm Brian Sword. This week on the show, I have singer Bernard Fowler. Now, Bernard has the distinction of being the backup vocalist for the Rolling Stones for the past, like, 26, 27 years. And that in itself is cool, but he's much more than that. He's got two solo records, including his new one, The Burra. He sung lead for Herbie Hancock, as well as solo records by Ronnie Wood and Charlie Watts. Plus a bunch of other bands like Tacad, and one band that I cannot recommend enough, Nickelback. No, 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 not Nickelback. Nickelback with Bernard and Stevie Salas. Now one thing to note before we get into the interview. This interview was done late at night and Bernard had just gotten off the road with the Stones. So you can hear he sounds pretty tired at the beginning of the interview. But when he gets warmed up, the stories start coming and it gets really great. So let's get right to it. This week is the story of Bernard Fowler. I am from, I'm from Queensbridge Project in Long Island City. And you asked, uh, what? What kind of uh, musical background? What kind of musical family did you grow up in? Uh, not very musical, you know, and since there, you know, no one, no one in my family had, you know, no one in my family had performed professionally. I think I'm the first one. My mother, my mother sang in church, you know, with her sisters growing up, but that's as musical as it got. So what led you down the musical path? I don't know. I think uh, I always say uh, it was probably uh, my mother would make me take naps and she would play the radio. And I think that radio had a lot to do with it. And also, you know, the stuff that her and my dad used to play. Mm -hmm. You know, the records they used to play. And when did you start singing then? I've always kind of sung, you know, around the house or something like that. But I think my first... The first gig I'd ever done, and actually got paid for it, I was probably 14. Okay. 14. Mm-hmm. And what kind of gig was that then? A, a friend of mine that I grew up with, his father, his father was a singer. And he used to play at a club up in town, uptown in Harlem called the Golden Terrace Ballroom. And uh, he saw, you know, we were practicing for, some, a, I think, a talent show, and he thought he would have us open the, open his show for him. And uh, that was the first gig. That was the first gig I'd ever done. I made five bucks. <laughs> and did you have any vocal training at that point, or were you just singing? No, I never had any vocal training at that point. And, and is, is that something you did, or is this kind of a... Did you learn naturally? Naturally. And in, in terms of early bands, how did that get started for you then? after that, that first performance? Well, I mean, that was, well, at the time, it was a one-off, pretty much. You know, I was still in school. I was still really involved in sports. And uh, a few years after that, uh, um, a girl I grew up with was dating a guy that was in a band. And he heard me singing on the street one day with some of my friends and asked me to come audition Audition for his band. Okay. And uh, finally, and finally, I went. You know, I went and I auditioned for the band. And I think a week later, I was in Media Sound recording an album. <laughs> All right, and that must have been a, obviously a little a bit of a trippy experience. Tell me about walking into the studio then, when a week earlier you were singing on the street corner. Yeah, it was. Totally strange. Uh, it's funny. Uh, I remember walking into Media Sound. You know, at the time, Media Sound was one of the biggest recording studios in New York City. And uh, I remember walking into two, two, two people. I remember seeing the first person I saw when I walked in Media Sound. There was a bench, and there was a guy in full buckskin, buckskin suit with you know. With these, uh, with these uh, high top moccasins, <laughs> and uh, 
I mean, he kind of looked familiar, but I wasn't sure, you know. So, so that's what I got. I, I saw who it was, and I was said to myself, holy shit. The first person that, that was, uh, that was, that, that person was Bernie Worrell. Oh, okay. From Parliament and Funkadella. And, uh, the next person I ran into was, uh, John Fattis, you know, famous jazz trumpet player. Okay. That was the next person I saw coming out of a room and I was, I was just blown away seeing those people in that studio. And the songs that you were in there to record, if you just joined the band, they must have been already written. And how familiar were you with them, or did you have to kind of make it up as you went? How familiar was I with? With the material you had to record if you just joined the band and you're already in the studio. No, but well, you know, I was a week, I was a week's worth familiar. <laughs> You know, I learned the song. I learned uh, the songs in a week, and that was it. Went in and did it. Uh, you know, when it happens that fast, I have to wonder if if it happens so fast that you really didn't even have time to think about it. So, like, did you have time to even be nervous about the situation you're in? Uh, yeah, I was nervous the whole time. Yeah, yeah, I remember being really nervous the whole time, and you know. And after I did it, I was, you know, it's kind of hard to listen to it. You know, it was kind of hard to listen to it, but, you know, I, I had an album. I was singing on an album, you know. At that time, you know, not many kids could say that. And it was an album back then. It wasn't a CD. That's right. And what became of the record? And what became of the record? Well, we, uh... Huh. We signed a record deal with Brunswick Records, the old Brunswick Records, and uh, uh, I think at that time, you know, Brun, you know, it, it, Brunswick heyday had long since passed. So <laughs> we were probably one of the uh, last things, last groups that was signed to Brunswick Records before before it shut completely. In terms of a timeline, about how old would you have been at this point? About sixteen, seventeen. Oh wow. Okay, so you were just a kid in there. Oh yeah. And is that something? Did you go on tour of, for that record, or did it just basically get recorded and kind of disappear? We uh, what we did, we went around. Uh, we went around the country and played some local spots. You know, from, you know, between New York and Virginia and wherever else we were. We didn't go. We didn't. It wasn't a tour like, you know, like, you know, tours. It, right. It was it, it was a handful of dates. And, you know, we jumped into a uh, jumped into a van and, you know, went to these different states. And I think a, a lot of the, if I'm not mistaken, half of those gigs were, you know, for the, uh, for the manage the manager's you know relatives you know the manager had at the party and you know <laughs> we were the entertainment <laughs> and uh, plus you know we were so busy on you know on the New York City catering house scene we didn't have time to tour every every weekend we were in a different catering house I probably played just about every catering house in New York City and what kind of what would that gig be like. Um, you know, (laughs) some of them were pretty funny, you know, some of them were pretty, you know, entertaining for us watching, you know, the drunk people at the wedding, (laughs) you know, and we were, we were the wedding band. Yeah. And you think that kind of playing that kind of gig after gig after gig on that circuit, would that have helped you hone your skills? Absolutely. There's no question about it. No question about it. We played a lot of gigs. And as it came out of that that scene, what was the next opportunity for you? Well, as I came out of that scene, okay, as I came out of that scene, um, you know, this band that I was in, you know, it had a lot of people come in, come and go, and you know, and you know, there was a drummer and a bass player that were playing with, you know, this first band of mine. 
that uh, we actually became we we actually became friends. You know, when I guess you know they were looking for you know other things to do, so they left the band and uh, they called me and told me that they wanted me to meet some people. And uh, I met them in um, I met them in Manhattan. We went to a loft in 30th Street. And uh, the two guys, the, the, the one guy that brought me there, he, he was a drummer for the New York City Peach Boys. That was Stephen Brown. He brought me and introduced me to a keyboard player. And, um, and you know, hanging around with these guys, we decided to form a band, form another band. We were called many things, you know, in the formation of this band. A lot of names, you know, we went through. But we ended up being the New York City Peach Boys. And what, what kind of music was that then? What, kind of, what was the style of that band? New York, New York City Peach Boys was it was it was dance music. It was club music. It's uh, it's what later we we started what later became house music. Okay. We were the first ones to do house music. We were the first ones to actually print print a twelve inch acapella, so DJs could mix. You know could mix, you know, their records. They could put the acapella with, you know, different different records. Um and it was also the first we were this was the first band that had a DJ as part of the band. Larry Levan. Larry Levan from the Paradise Garage fame was, you know, part of, you know, the Peach Boys. And what kind of what kind of success did you guys have? We had really good success with the Peach Boys. Um you know, I can remember walking through New York City, and every seemed like every half hour I heard myself on the radio. <laughs> um, we were, we had we had two really big uh, records, you know, that we thought were just you know New York City club records, but you know later found out that you know the record was it had circulated through the country. I remember sitting at home and seeing seeing it on the American Bandstand, which was quite a treat. Um, uh, the two songs that uh, the two songs that uh, there were there were a few songs that the Peach Boys put out, but the two most popular songs were two songs that I you know that I actually wrote, which was um, "Don't Make Me Wait," and uh, which was the first single, and the second one was a song called "Life Is Something Special." And as those songs did quite well, would you have gone on tour for that? Yeah, well, actually. Actually, we went to, <laughs> again, um, <laughs> we did a lot of, uh, we did, you know, dates around around the country, not really tour, just dates. Um, uh, uh, um, the, uh, the original record of uh, Don't Make Up the Peach Boys was on a small independent label called West End. Uh, that deal, uh, we we signed a deal with Island Records. So Chris Blackwell wanted us on the road, so he sent us to England to do a tour around England. Uh, it was um, kind of funny because the Peach Boys, that record had really not had not reached England at that time. We were there before the record actually oh. got there. <laughs> so we're touring around England, and people don't know what the hell we're playing. They don't know this song. They didn't know the song. It wasn't until we left England that the Peach Boys became, you know, kind of recognized, you know, in Europe. <laughs> oh, that's a challenge. What happened with the Peach Boys then? What happened with the Peach Boys is what happens to a lot of bands, um, unfortunately. Um, you know, you get a record that becomes popular, that means that there's some money around. And whenever there's money around, people get really weird and people get greedy. And um, this is what happened to the Peach Boys. Um, you know, the member that we elected to uh, represent us, you know, he was a keyboard player. And we chose him to represent us, and he had his own agenda going. I'll, I'll never forget. Um, I'll never forget us going to a meeting 
we were going to a meeting. I, I think it was with Island Records or someone, and um, and uh, you know the guy that we had used as our lawyer was there. And uh, we were talking about something, and, you know, and we were like, well, you know, he's our lawyer. You know, he should be dealing with this. And at that point, he informed us, no, I'm not your lawyer. I'm his lawyer. Oh, boy. So the keyboard player had hired our lawyer. So the band was without a lawyer. (laughs) (laughs) Um, Just a very strange time. Anyway, during that time, during that time, I, um, you know, there was a lot of, lot of underhandedness going on, and I knew it. You know, I got a, you know, I got a record playing on the radio every half an hour, and I'm not getting any money. Mm. And so, uh, 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 the guy that, like I said, that was uh, supposed to represent the band, I remember him coming home with a, with a car. And a, and, a, and a Doberman Pinscher puppy, a silver Doberman Pinscher. <laughs> now, you don't have to be a rocket scientist to know that that silver Doberman Pinscher cost him a lot of money. Uh-huh. And, you know, I didn't have money. None of, the band, none of us, you know, the musicians had, had money. So, um... Make a long story short, I had I had res- uh, resigned to the fact that that they were stealing, and I wasn't getting what I was supposed to. So at that point, I began to think to say to myself, you know what, I'm just going to give them enough rope to hang themselves because some way I'm getting out of here. And and uh, that some way came fairly soon. I got a call from um, from Bill Laswell, Bill Laswell, uh, producer. Oh yeah. And uh, and I started doing I started doing records with him. I started doing sessions for him. You know the early hip hop, hop the early hip hop stuff, African Bambada, you know Fab Five, Freddy, B Side, you know all celluloid records. And uh, Bill was doing a, a record by Material, and he said he he called me and asked me if I would come and sing. You know, and I explained to him about the Peach Boys, but you know, I had always had this uh, this kind of uh, agreement with the Peach Boys that if I got called to do a session, I was going to do the session. You know, I would give you know I would give credit where I needed to give credit. So. I even mentioned to them about this session with Bill Laswell. Okay, so I did the session with Bill Laswell. The next thing I know, the, that record is playing all over the freaking radio. And uh, <laughs> I think it 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 freaked it freaked the it freaked the uh, the powers of the Peach Boys out. You know, I was I was singing on another record that was playing in New York City. And uh, they gave me a little shit about it, and uh, I was, you know, I got another call from Bill as well to come and uh, do, uh, to come and uh, do some singing for him on a Herbie Hancock record. You know, I've been listening to Herbie since I was, you know, really young, so I jumped at the opportunity, and uh, for, uh, you know, one of those records. The record, the record that he won the Grammy for, Future Shock. Yeah, I sang the title track. I did a lot of the vocal stuff on there, and uh, I used, uh, I think I used my name maybe for one, but I used an alias name for another because I knew they would give me, a, they would give me a hard time. <laughs> so, so uh, the Herbie Hancock record came out, Rocket. Yeah, the biggest record of that. Yeah, the biggest record of that year, and I get a call from Bill asking me if I would, if I would be interested in touring with Herbie. I had never been on a real tour at that point. Ah, yeah. So uh, I jumped at the opportunity, you know, and um, toured with Herbie for maybe two years, maybe a little more than two years, and it was a real tour. We went practically all over the world. And that record was so huge, that must have been a heck of a tour. It was a heck of a tour. The record was huge, 
huge. It was a, it was an incredible time, you know, plus to be on the road with something so innovative. It was not a record, you know, that was the first time uh, a turntable was used on a, on an actual record, you know, so hip hop was breaking out into mainstream in a major way with rocket. So I toured with her before, like I said, a few years. Ironically, I just have I just had Dave Jordan on the show last week. Uh, what was he like Incredible. to work with on that record? Dave Jordan was mellow as a cello. He had a great room called El Dorado, off of uh, I think it was off Hollywood Boulevard. Hollywood Boulevard, and uh, I remember going there to work. I met I met I met Dave Jordan through Bill Laswell. During my travel with Herbie Hancock, you know, we were touring and I had some time off. So I had 10 days off to be exact. So I left the tour. I went to New York, went to my apartment, you know, brand new apartment. I had not been there. I just got it before I started the tour with Herbie. So uh, I walk into my apartment, phone rings, it's Bill, you know, telling me, you know, I, you know, I told him I just got home. He says, okay, well, go, go, go back to the airport. <laughs> and I'm saying, okay. I said, no, no, you don't understand, Bill. I just walked into my apartment. He said, okay, well, go back to the airport. There's a ticket at the airport, you know, you know, just go give him your name. So I literally grabbed my suitcase, oh. called the taxi, and I went back to JFK. I get to the desk and I ask, do you have a ticket for me? Yes. Where's the ticket going? You're going to London. Blah, blah, blah. Okay. I didn't know where I was going. <laughs> so I arrived in London. I arrived in London at the, uh, at a Heathrow and, you know, I get through customs and the bill is there, you know, you know, hey man, blah, 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 you know, uh, and still he's not telling me why I'm, well, I'm in London, and, you know, we walk out of the airport, and he's got a driver and a huge black Bentley. Had me worried a little bit because I don't know what the hell was going on. I just saw Bill in this big fucking, this big, uh, this big car. So we're driving through London. We stop. We pick up a journalist. We do an interview, drop the journalist off, we continue on our way, and we're just talking about music. And in the and during you know during our talk, he did ask me. He said he said, Vern, he asked me if I liked the Rolling Stones, and I'm like, yeah, you know, I love the Stones. The first record I ever owned as a kid was a Rolling Stones record. And like, really? I'm like, yeah. Well, how did you get that? Well, my father bought it for me. Don't ask me why my father bought me that record because I couldn't tell you. So we uh, end up in an area of London called Swiss Cottage. And I walk in, you know, we get to this house, you know, we walk in, you know, the security guy, you know, points to a room. Bill walks in, I walk behind him, and there's some guy sitting on the floor with a guitar. I could only see his back. At which point Bill walks, you know, around and said to him, hey, he said, hey, man, this is Bernard Fowler. This is the guy I've been telling you about. And the guy turned around and looked up, and it was Nick. <laughs> you know, he was sitting on the floor with a guitar in his hand. So Bill leaves the room, you know, and I'm, you know, I'm standing there. I'm like in shock. You know, I didn't know I was going to meet Mick Jagger. I didn't know what I was doing. So I stood there for a seem, seemed like a longer than it was, I'm sure. And uh, Mick asked me to come down on the floor. He said, come on down here with me, you know. So he's playing and, you know, we're singing. We're singing and, you know, we spent a couple hours, a few hours doing that. And, um, you know, on my way to the hotel, he gives me a cassette. A cassette of some of the tracks from She's the Boss. So I happen to have a four-track Fostex uh, cassette recorder, so I put the cassette in, and I did all the background treatment on this four, on this uh, four track cassette machine. So the next day we get to Air Studios, and uh, you know we're talking and listening, and Mick says, "Well, I need some stuff for this, and I need some stuff for that." Da, da, da. You know, let's go in and you know 
try to come up some ideas for these songs. And I said, well, wait, before we do that, I said, listen to this, you know, and I gave him the, the, uh, the cassette player and I, you know, hit play and he listened to, you know, and he said, you did all this. I, he said, when did you do, do this? I said, well, after I left you, I did it in the hotel room last night. He said, oh, that's great. He said, well, then let's do that. Which was, you know, that was just, that was the ultimate. He liked what I did in the hotel room. So, you know, I tracked it all. During that time, yeah, I ran into Paul McCartney in the hallway in the hallway of the studio we were working at. And I remember Paul McCartney, I remember him coming into the room where we were, and I remember uh, him being kicked out, being kicked out of the <laughs> session, which, you know, was amazing. I saw, you know, a Beatle get kicked out of a Rolling Stone session. <laughs> That's amazing. Yeah, it was, it was totally surreal. And you're just standing there, how did I get here? <laughs> yeah, exactly. And, you know, yeah. <laughs> and that's, uh, you know, that's how I met, that's how I met Nick. When that album was finished, did you just go home or did that carry on into the next Stones record? No, no. When I finished working on She's the Boss, I went back on the road with Herbie Hancock. Oh, right. And after Herbie Hancock, you know, I, I went back to New York, you know, you know, making music, doing sessions, and I remember, um, I can't, I can't remember the exact year, but anyway, I, I get another call, I get a call, I get a call from, uh, you know, some some local cats in music, or some of my friends, and they're like, yo, man, I heard that. This is this is years after I'd worked with Nick, and they, so they call me and say, "Hey man, I heard Nick Jagger's in town, and he's looking for a male vocalist. Did you get a call?" And I'm like, "Really? No, I'm not. I've not got a call. I I haven't even. I didn't even hear that." So, um, so uh, I got a call from a friend of mine, Carmine Rojas. You know. Carmine Rojas, uh, you know, I think he was playing with David Bowie at the time, and uh, he had this uh, thing where we had a corp- he had a corporate gig in um, in Avignon in France that we were going to go and do, and it was you know all of us all of us hired guns, hired guns of the big boys. We were getting together and doing this this gig, so we were in SIR. We were in SIR rehearsing for this gig and uh while we're rehearsing some you know I walk out to I walk out the room to go to the bathroom and I ran right into Nick, you know. I looked at him, he looked at me and I said, Hey Nick, how you doing? And he kinda, you know, looked at me and just kept walking. And then so I I uh I went back into my room and I said to the guys, I said you know what? I just I just ran into Jagger in the uh, hallway, and he acted like he didn't know who I was. So five ten minutes later, some girl walks in in uh, into our rehearsal room and says, uh, "Is there Bernard Fowler here?" And nobody nobody said anything. It was the weirdest thing. Nobody said anything. Everybody's looking around. And I, I said, well, I'm Bernard Fowler. And she said, oh, well, I don't know if you know, but, you know, um, Nick Jagger's trying to do a, is going to do a solo tour, and he's been looking for a male vocalist, and uh, we'd like to know if you'd audition. Here's a tape, and here's, you know, some lyrics, and she leaves the room. And I was highly insulted. I was insulted. I had worked with Mick on his first solo record. I thought I did a good enough job, but you know, I guess not. They're asking me to audition. So she left the room and she left the room and I said I said, I'm not fucking auditioning. I'm not gonna do that. I've already worked with him. Why the fuck do I have to audition? At which point Carmine Rojas you know, grabbed me by the arm and took me in the corner and said to me, whether you, whether you take this gig or not, 
go do the audition anyway. And so, you know, I grumbled a little bit, but, you know, <laughs> Carmine's like, you know, Carmine's like our big brother, you know. So I took the uh, the cassette and lyrics and went into the bathroom, listened to, I think it was like four songs, and they were all Stone songs. So I go back to the, uh, I go to the room, you know, and I walk in and there's uh you know, a line of chairs with all these people sitting there, and, you know, and I walk in and, you know, he's got a, you know, he got a killer band, you know, who's who, you know, Joe Satriani, Doug Wimbish, oh, nice. you know, Simon Phillips, um, you know, Jimmy Rip. Uh, so I walk in and Jimmy Rip, who is now a real good friend of mine, but I, I didn't know him then. So I walk into the room and he didn't, you know, and I walk in, you know, I'm saying hi to everybody. And he looks at me like, like I was some fucking chump. Like I was another chump coming to audition and he put his arms over his, resting his arms on his guitar and he looks at me and says, like, you ready? And that pissed me the fuck off. <laughs> yeah, I bet. So they started playing these songs, and I said to, I said in my head, I said, you know what? Oh yeah, you're gonna treat me like that. Now I'm gonna kick your ass. And I fucking kicked ass. I sang, had to sing four Stone songs, and there was, you know, all the people, Nick, lined up with the choreographer, with all these people just lined up. So at the end of the fourth song, the song ended. And the room was kind of quiet. And I walked over. I gave back the cassette and the lyrics, and I walked out of the room. I went back into my room. And that same girl comes back in and says, well, Nick would like you to go on tour with him, and blah, 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 and something about rehearsals. We need to stop it. And I'm like, no, I can't. I can't do that. And she said, well, why not? I said, because I have a gig. I have a gig in the south of France. Well, how, how long before you get back? I said, you know, 10 days or whatever. And she said, you know, I think that'll be fine. So when I got back, I went into rehearsals with Jagger for the solo tour. Did you ever find out why he brushed you off in the hallway? No. <laughs> All right. No, never asked. Yeah. And then, obviously, that started, you know, a relationship that's going on 25 years or something. So that initial tour, how did that tour go? And, and you know, there must have been some serious bonding with the guys. Well, yeah. The, uh, the, his uh, first solo tour was incredible. It was incredible. I got to go places I didn't get to go with Herbie. And, uh, again, the band was killer. It was killer band. Yeah. Uh, you know, and, you know, Mick is always just kicking ass. So, you know, it, it was a, it was a, it was a treat. It was a treat, uh, being on, on the road with Mick. So I did that. I'm not, how long did that last? Maybe a year or whatever. If that long. And, uh, and during that time, there was, uh, you know, during that time, Mick and Keith, I think, were, they were fighting. There was a lot of stuff in the press. So after that, uh, oh, well, during, during, during the rehearsals for Jagger, uh, one night, Doug Wimbish was doing a show at the Ritz with Tackhead. Mm -hmm. Now, I'd heard, I had heard of Tackhead, but I've never seen Tackhead. So, you know, he says, yeah, come down and check us out, blah, blah, blah. So I go down and check it, you know, I check them, listening to them play, and I was blown away. I was blown away by what I was hearing, and there was a one particular song that they played that I think Melly Mel from Grandmaster Flash and the Furious Five was there, and he rapped. He rapped over this groove. And uh, I said, wow, that, that, 
that thing that they're dealing with, it would be a whole lot better if it was sung. And so the next day I said something, I said something to Doug about it, and, you know, we talked, and he's like, you know what? Man, man, well, I need to get you to London so you could come and, you know, work with uh, with me and Tackhead, you know. So after 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 the uh, Jagger tour, uh, I was starting to spend time with Doug Bish and, and Tackhead. And uh, so uh, I went to London. I went to London to meet them all. I met them. We hit it off. We were we went right into the studio and started recording some things. Um, now uh, I I had no intention of living in London, but I think I ended up being there for about two and a half years. Oh wow! And we had signed we had signed a record deal. I had signed a record deal with Taghead in the UK, and. Um, not knowing at the time, but my my presence there had caused a bit of a rub with some of the members. Anyway, I stayed in London. I did the uh, I did you know the uh, I did one record, one record with uh, Tag Hand. I think it was called uh, Strange Things. We did an album called Strange Things, and we you know we were playing around the UK all the time, UK Scotland. We were there all the time, and uh, uh, so I, I did. As I'm there, you know, telephone rings, and uh, somebody, you know, is uh, "Hey, man, uh, Mick Jagger's been looking for you." I'm like, "What are you talking about?" Yeah, he's he's called a couple of times. Uh, it, you know, he's looking for you. I'm like, "Well, leave a number." He's like, "Yeah, yeah, yeah." I said, "Where is he?" He said, "He's in London. Where you are?" So I called, I called, and uh, I guess who didn't know, but I was there for two, like two years. And he called me, and we're talking, and he says, uh, you know, he says, uh, Bernard, I'm, you know, the Stones are going to make a record, you know, for the first time in like nine years or so, and uh, I could really use a hand, you know, at the studio. Okay, well, where are you? I'm at Olympic Studio, blah, 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 blah. No, it wasn't Olympic Studio. It was someplace else. Can't remember. Anyway, I go by there. I'm listening to some of the tracks that they've recorded, you know, for this record. And uh, Mix, you know, he asked me to go in and, you know, come up with some parts, come up with some background parts for the song, at which point I do. Um, and uh, so I come out so we can talk about these ideas that I put down, and then one by one, the stones start to come in. Uh, you know, I think first Charlie comes in, Bill, you know, I think Keith and Ronnie, I think in that order, they all came in, you know. And um, well, we're, we're listening to these ideas I put down, so make says, you know, okay, so we have the ideas now, so let's go, you should go in there and do them now. And um, I told him, I said, well, you know, I'm not going to do that. Uh, I think uh, some of you guys should come in here and sing with me. I said, I'm happy to do it if you want me to. I said, but, uh, you know, if I do all this stuff by myself, it's going to sound like me. It shouldn't just sound like me. Right, yeah. And uh, it got quiet. And uh, Mick says, okay, I'm sending Ronnie and Keith in. So they came in, and I showed them the parts that I had come up with and, you know, gave them the notes. And we were in there singing, and, you know, so we do it. We go in to listen to the playback. And, you know, Keith is staring at me. Keith is staring at me, and I'm like, you know, why is this guy staring at me? (laughs) And finally, I got the balls to ask him. I said, you know, hey, man, is something wrong? No, nothing's wrong. I'm saying, are you sure? You know, you keep staring at me. No, no, nothing's wrong. I said, you know, I said, you sure? I said, I'm cool, man, you know. At which point he says, I know you're cool. (laughs) I know you're cool. I spoke to Steve Jordan. 
and he told me that you're cool. He said, and then he says, well, you know. I said, yeah, I'm cool. He said, well, I thought you were one of mixed boys, so I wasn't sure. Some shit like that. <laughs> and that was my first meeting with the Rolling Stones. Wow. wow. <laughs> and that was about 27 years ago, 28 years ago, something like that. And through that period of time, you've not only worked with the Stones and Mick, but also a bunch of the other members' solo stuff, too. Yeah. Oh, yes, yes. During that time, I was, uh, I, uh, you know, I uh, did a couple of jazz records with Charlie. Um, it didn't start out me singing. You know, uh, Charlie wrote a book about Charlie Parker. We built a show around it. So I was narrating the book, and then he asked me if I would sing a couple of songs. And um, I had never, I had never really uh, ventured into you know standards, jazz standards, or, you know, classic jazz song. So. You know, and I, so I was, it was a treat for me to, to, to get in there. You know, I, I realized I liked it a lot more than I, I even knew. So I did, I think I did three records with Charlie Watts. And, uh, during, during, uh, like, uh, during some, some live dates with Charlie, Ronnie Wood, uh, asked me if I would come to Ireland to write with him. He wanted to make a new record, and, you know, what else was I going to do? So I said, yeah, sure, I'd, I'll go with you, and I did. I went with him to Ireland to do some writing, and the day after I arrived, he left. He left Ireland. So I'm in, I'm in, I'm in his house. <laughs> he left for like five fucking days. <laughs> Five days, I'm in his house in the middle of the countryside uh, with an engineer in a studio and no Ronnie. Did he at least have music down for you to work with? No. He just left? No. He just left. <laughs> he left, went to London. Like I said, I was there for like five, six days. And after like the first three, two, three days, I'm like, this fucking guy's not coming back. So I, I told the engineer, you know, hire. I need a drum machine and I need a keyboard. And so I just thought, you know what? I'll just take advantage of this, of my time here alone. So I got the drum machine and the keyboard, and I started writing songs. I started writing songs for him for this record that I'm there to do. And I think I wrote maybe three songs. So he finally came back and uh, I told him to come into the studio. So he came into the studio with his, with his wife at the time, Josephine. And I said, I want you to hear, I want you to hear what I've been doing. So I played him these tracks. One of the songs was uh, the song Josephine from uh, the album Slide on This. And uh, after he listened to these three songs, he said, wow. And he then he says, uh, well, I guess we don't need a producer, do we? He said, would you do it? And, you know, after I had to think about it for a second. And I thought, you know what? Uh, yeah, I'll do it. So I agreed to uh, stay on and produce the record. Uh, the solo record for Roddy, uh, which was a great experience for me. Um, all the people on that record, uh, I had to call because he wouldn't call them. He would give me the numbers and tell me to call. And I thought, well, shit, if you call, you know, you know, we'll probably, it'll be easier, I thought. But once I called them, these people and told them what I was doing, they all showed up. They all showed up and uh, we made a really good record. Can you tell me a little bit about how you met Stevie Salas? Because that's another relationship that you've, you've had for quite a few years. Yeah. Wow. Well, well, how I met Stevie Salas, again, that's uh, Bill Laswell days. I was... Uh, I was away somewhere. I'm not sure where I was. Maybe I was in London or something. Maybe I was doing some tech and stuff. And I had come, gone to New York and uh, built calls and 
And uh, he introduces me to this guy, Stevie Salas. You know, Stevie Salas. I don't know. Do you know Stevie Salas? Oh, yeah. I've had him on the show as well. Okay, so you know Stevie Salas. Oh, yeah. Stevie Salas is not from New York. Stevie Salas is from California. Yeah, San Diego. Yeah, San Diego. Yeah, so Stevie Salas was doing the record, and he had a... And he... He wanted, he wanted me to sing a, a song on this record of his, and it was a cover of, the, of Groove Line. Uh, I, I remember doing that. I think it was Stevie, T.M. Stevens. Uh, who was on drums? I'm not sure. Maybe. I don't remember who was on drums. But Okay, so I did that, that track for him. I guess the track did, you know, really good for him. Uh, and then uh, I get a call from him, you know, wanting to do a record. He wanted to do a project with me. And, you know, I heard some of the stuff that, you know, he was doing, you know, blah, blah, blah. So, I, you know, I agreed to do it. And, uh, you know, one thing about me, if I agree to do something, I go all in. And uh, so we did this record, and, you know, to this day, it's probably one of my favorite projects I've been involved with. It was the the Nickel Bag record. Nickel Bag, the album was called 12 Hits and a Bump. And uh, Nickel Bag, the record, it was, it was a critically acclaimed record, but it didn't get as circulated as it should have. Um, Everyone loved the record. People still talk about that record now. You know, uh, they ask, "Hey, how can I get you know nickel bag? How can I get nickel bag?" And um, you know, we went around. We did do some dates with that. It, it was really funny. You know, going around. This is this is the year that hell bop was flying in the sky. I remember we were in Vegas and I saw the comet. All oh, right. Going across the yeah, I remember seeing it go across the, the desert sky. That's how it, I remember it. And, uh, so, you know, Nickelback is getting some some uh, some some okay radio play. You know, people people are hearing it and people are loving it. Uh, Stevie even called me and said, hey, man, I got a call from Sammy Hagar, man. He just heard our record on the radio and blah, 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 and he fucking loved it and blah, blah. And, and uh, I remember we were we were in Vegas someplace. I think it was Vegas. We pull up in the bus. We pull up in the bus. We get out of the bus and we're walking to the venue. There's a crowd of kids outside. And they're like, "Oh shit, nickel bag, nickel bag!" And they're you know they're kind of following us in. And I think one of the kids said to Stevie, "Hey, where's the singer? Where's the singer?" Where's the singer? And Stevie pointed at me and said, there he is right there. And the guy looked like he saw a fucking ghost. And he said, you? He said, you're the singer? I said, yeah. Oh, shit. I thought you were a white dude. (laughs) They had no idea they had no idea I was a brother. And it was, you know, and it's funny that that happened because that was the, uh, on that, that album cover, the album cover, I insisted that Stevie and I paint our faces silver. Mm-hmm. So no one would know what we were. Because then even still then there would have been there would have been a a a kind of rub with that with seeing you know the fucking mexican and the brother playing this kind of rock and roll it wasn't happening at that point or maybe it was i think maybe living color had just done something sure that's about it though yeah yeah, but that was about it. So, and I remember saying to myself, "Yes, 
Yet, that's why I insisted that the that we paint our faces silver for this for those photos for that reaction. You know, it's funny. I have the album in my hand actually, and uh-huh. when you know, I'd ask Stevie a very similar question about the cover, especially because on the inside cover you've got the painting that Ronnie Wood did. So I thought, you know, I was asking, I was amazed that that wouldn't have been the album cover. And he said the exact same thing you just said about the face paint. And I was, I couldn't believe it. And it's, so it's funny to hear you say the exact same thing. That's exactly what Stevie told me about this album cover. Yep. Yep. We didn't want that to be in the way of people hearing some good rock and roll. Yeah. And uh, that's, that is one of the best records of that, of that time. Oh yeah, it's it's not a because of, not because I'm on it, but because it just is. It's a killer break, and it doesn't sound like anybody else. It's got its completely and distinct, it unique sound. Doesn't sound like anybody else. Yeah, and it doesn't. It doesn't even sound like a Stevie Sanders record. No, no, it's its own beast. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, and I know there's a couple versions of the record that came out, and then you guys kind of went on to other things, and now you're playing again, but you have a different name. Why did the name change? Yeah, we, uh, we changed the name because of Nickelback. I got sick of hearing it. We say, you know, well, the Nickelback record was actually out before Nickelback. Yeah. So, but, you know, when, uh, when, you, when, you, got a, when you got a record label behind you, uh, you know, I guess, you know, people were hearing nickel back more than they were hearing nickel bag. And we just didn't, uh, we didn't want, we didn't want that confusion right. anymore. Well, nickel bag is a way cooler name. Yes. Way cooler <laughs> name. And, uh, way cooler name, way cooler fucking band, man. <laughs> nickel back sucks. That's right. and so you know so when we did decide you know a few years ago to go out and do some do some playing together we we decided to call it i am the imf the imf it comes from it comes from uh when i was on tour with uh with the stones keith and i we used to make up these stories about the different headlines on the uh on the uh on the uh the different headlines on newspapers on the plane and we'd make up all kinds of stupid stories and one day one day I'm I got the paper and I'm looking at the paper and it was something about the IMF blah 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 and I'm like wow the IMF the IMF and I went and showed Keith and Keith was assigning, you know, uh, the Minister of Interior and, you know, the uh, the Minister of Arts, and he was the president, and da 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 da. And I showed Keith the headline, and he looks at it, and, and and I said to him, "The IMF, Keith." He's looking at me. I said, "The international motherfuckers." <laughs> Because he was talking about how, you know, we fly in and out of these countries, you know, we're just like international. So it's like, yeah, we're the international motherfuckers. You know, something we called ourselves while we were on the road. So when when we were looking for a name change, you know, Stevie said, hey, man, why don't we just call it the IMF? And I'm like, uh, you know what? That was the name that Keith and I had, but I didn't think Keith would mind mind us mind me using it for something else so we called it the you know the international motherfuckers and there is a live record that i've seen about online what's the status of that when's it going to be available uh north america as of right now that record will not see north america as of right now that record because that record was hell to make it was a major fucking headache uh, between, you know, 
these people on Stevie is just me to, to to do the freaking record of his problem with them and you know, just the whole recording of the record, it, it just got a little messy for me. Okay. And um and I was on the road with the Stones trying to finish that record and I just said, you know what? After I heard the the end result, I wasn't that happy with it. So I just said, you know what? No, the record's not going out record's not going out. But my good friend Stevie, I, I saw what you saw the other day. I'm just looking through Facebook and I see something about uh, the I Am Amps European Tour album, yeah. blah, blah, blah. And I'm, yeah, I saw that and I'm like, what? At which point I called Stevie and said, what the fuck? What, what is this? How come I don't know about this? Oh, no, no, it's not out. I had a handful of copies, and when I was at some gig, I sold I sold those few copies that I had to some hardcore fans. So this hardcore fan just assumed that this was a record that was coming out. Uh-huh. But as of right now, that record is not coming out. What about any new studio records with you and Stevie? Any new studio records? We've been talking about, we were talking about that when we were playing. When I was, when I had started recording my record, we had talked about it. But, uh, you know, coming up with the funds to do it, the whereabouts to do it, and the favors we needed to do it, it just turned in, you know, we could never, we couldn't get it together to do. So, Hopefully, that'll change. You know, maybe next year or something, that'll change and we'll get to go in and do a real studio record. But again, that IMF live record, I don't, I don't know if it'll ever see the light of day. I, I'm, I, you have, Stevie will have to convince me that, it's, that it sounds better than it did when I heard it last. <laughs> Fair enough. Can you tell me about your solar records? I know you have a new one that's just came out and you did one a couple of years ago. Can you tell me about the process of putting those together? Well, the first the first record friends with privilege is um, you know you know, because I spend so much time on the road, you know, I you know, I feel a lot a lot of times that I'm not spending enough time in the studio. And um, Friends with Privileges, I wanted to do that. That was, what, about six years ago. I wanted to do it, and, and uh, while I was on the road with the sounds, I started compiling, compiling material. I'd done some writing with Wadi Wachtel. Uh, I, had a, I had a kind of studio in my house at the time, so, so not a lot of it, but some of it, you know, was recorded in my house and also at the Mint Recording Studio at the time. Um, and uh, you know, like, like with you know, like with my new record, you know, it's all my friends, all my friends that you know that are around and that you know are available to come and play with me. That's that's how I make the record. Uh, that's how I made uh, you know friends with privileges. Um, I had to do that. That was my first solo record, as you know. I've had records with, you know, a few different bands, but I'd never had a solo record. So that record, as uh, as far as a genre goes, that record was really wide. Mm-hmm. It was really wide, but I needed to do that. I needed to make that record. That record needed to be made because um, uh, it, helped, it helped my focus and my direction for the next record, which is the new one, the Buddha. And with the new record, you know, times have changed and it's a lot easier. It's still never easier to get it together, but in terms of getting it out there and getting it heard, there are now some avenues. So what are you looking to do with this record? I want this record. I want everyone to hear the record. I, I am, I'm really happy with this record. More happy than, you know, well, it's, it's a different record from, Friends with Privileges. Uh, I think it's a, it's a more focused record as well. It didn't start out that way. I 
I was just, uh, when I started, you know, recording for the Bora, I just wanted to make a really, I wanted to make a quick record. Something that I could, a, a, a record I could sell at, at gigs that I was doing. That was, you know, that was the whole point. But then, once I started it, once I started it and the music started taking form and I realized, you know what, I can't, I can't do this quick. I've got to really pay attention because some really good things are happening. And, um, you know, I, like I said, I didn't, I was, I hadn't been spending, you know, enough time in the studios and, you know, you know, before I, before I left here, I wanted to make a really good record that people would say, you know what? Wow. That was, that was some record. Um, it's a little more focused than Friends with Privileges, but it is a guitar-oriented record. It's a guitar record. And who did you have play on it with you? On the record, um, I had a guitar player, a young cat by the name of Robert Davis, who is doing a, a lot of the co-writing with me. Um, Wadi Wachtel. A legend, great. Phil X. Oh, great. Albert Lee Slash, uh, Fode Musa Suso, uh, Sugar Blue, Jimmy Paxson, Doug Wimbish, <laughs> Will Calhoun, oh, wow. El, El Shankar, uh, Jeff Bova, Chris Tello, David Goodstein, uh, Skip McDonald from Tackhead, um, Keith LeBlanc, uh, Lenny Castro. Uh, I, I hope I didn't leave anybody out. I, I'm, I probably did, but oh, uh, Ike, Ike Parker from Mars Volta, All the right. keyboard player. Yeah. Ike played on it before he left us. Um, you know, there's some people that I, that I really wanted to be on the record, you know, Bobby Keys, I wanted to be on the record. Uh, he didn't stick around long enough. Uh, Billy Gibbons, I wanted him on the record, but he was, uh, he had some ZZ top dates he had to, he had to uh, finish. So I wasn't able to get him, um. You know, and uh, you know, it's funny. I didn't ask. I didn't. I didn't ask any of the Rolling Stones to play on the record um, because you know, trying to find them and trying to get them to do things can be pretty difficult. Sure. Plus, everybody was expecting that. <laughs> Everyone was expecting that I would have one or two of them on the record. And I, I, I really, I wanted to stand on my own two feet. And that sounds like you said you wanted to do a quick, simple record to get that many people involved. It sounds like the project expanded into something much, much bigger. Like, how long did it take to get this record together? Hell yeah, it sure did. It <laughs> took about two years to get it together. It took about two years to get it together, but I think, like, the total work, the total work time... It's probably nine months. Right. Now, for the people who want it to get the record, where is it available at right now? Amazon, iTunes. Um, it's in a, some, I, I couldn't tell you which record stores, it, it, you know, would be carrying it, but some of record stores are carrying it. Uh, I was really thrilled to see uh, Amazon gave it a five-star rating. Oh, great. And, uh, iTunes also gave me a five star rating. I can't believe it. Great. And you think you're going to be able to play any shows for it? I absolutely will. Uh, first date I'll do is on the twentieth of uh, August. I'm doing the I'm doing the Jimmy Fallon show on the nineteenth. Oh, brilliant! I'm doing Jimmy Fallon on the nineteenth, and I'll uh, do a show at the Highline Ballroom the next day. Oh, brilliant! I did. I think the day after the Highline show, I'm doing the Stone Pony. That was Bernard Fowler. I hope you enjoyed it. 
Check out thedoublestop.com for links to buy the new Bernard Fowler CD, The Burra. And please do yourself a favor and check out Nickelbag, or the IMFs as they're now known. They're amazing. Well, that's it for this week. I'll be back next week with an interview with a bass player that has played with both George Lynch and Jennifer Lopez. He's got a heck of a great story to tell. That's next week on The Double Stop. <laughs> <laughs>